So today's lecture is going to cover 7.3, which will be the end of World War I. We're not going to focus as much on the combat, but more on the agreements that kind of shaped the world after World War I ended. The vocabulary for today is pretty extensive because there's going to be a lot of things that you probably haven't heard of before. So total war is where all resources in a nation go for the war effort. You have to think of it as everybody is working for the war. Young men are drafted to fight. Women are either nurses or acting as radio operators. People at home, all the factories are building war material. Children in the school may be collecting scrap iron for the war. There's rationing. Everything is done for the war. Conscription is simply just the draft. So all young men um, are made to join the military. The Lusitania, we'll go over a little bit more, but it's a British like passenger ship. Propaganda, you probably know what propaganda is, but propaganda can be more than just posters or videos. It's just a spreading of, I of ideas to either promote your side or kind of damage the other side. The 14 points, again, we'll go over, but I wanted you to have it on the vocab here. And self-determination is the one you should star the most. So self-determination is the right of people to choose their own government. So this is the idea that if you are an ethnic group that has your own unique nation or your own unique culture and you want your own government, you should be able to have it. An armistice is just ending a fighting. It's not a peace treaty. It's just an agreement to end the fighting in a war. A reparation, we've had this before, is a payment for a war. So if your side damaged another side in a war and you're paying reparations, it usually means you were defeated and now you're having to pay that side that beat you. Collective security is where a bunch of different nations come together and they all act as one to protect each other. So think of it like, would you rather walk down a dark alley by yourself or with a bunch of friends? By yourself, it's just you if somebody tries to mug you, but with your friends, you can all fight as one, and it kind of makes you safer. And then we will go over what a mandate is. A lot of students have trouble on this. A mandate is territory that was taken from the central powers and was given to the allies to kind of govern after World War I. So around 1915, when governments began to see that World War I wasn't just going to be a short war, they began to go into total war mode. Um, immediately, conscription starts. So if you were a young man who was able to serve, you were getting drafted into the Army, the Navy, the new Air Forces, whatever the government needed you to do. Governments began to raise taxes to pay for the war. They began to ration food and gas. So you could only get so much gas. You could only get so much food because they want to supply their militaries. They want to make sure that their militaries have everything they need. As men began to join the military, more and more women began to take over the factory jobs to produce the weapons, to produce the ammunition, to produce the food that was needed for these countries to run these wars. That's probably going to be one of the biggest changes actually right here. And we're going to see that women moving into the factories is going to have a huge effect on society after the war. Women also began to directly volunteer for the military, mostly becoming nurses, some as radio operators at the actual front, run, front, front lines. Because it's total war, though, citizens become targets of the war as well. So we went over this a little bit, but Britain and Germany try to starve each other into submission. So Britain blockades Germany, making sure that Germany can't get any resources from its colonies, and then Germany tries to do the same thing with its U-boats. But the Germans do what's called unrestricted submarine warfare, where any ship that is headed towards Britain, rather it is a passenger liner, if it is a warship, if it is a merchant ship, they're going to sink it. They're going to try and completely cut off Britain. But this is a major problem because the U-boats begin to sink ships that have citizens of countries that aren't in the war. They sink the Lusitania, which is a British ship, but it has Americans on it. This angers, this angers the United States. The United States threatens war, and it eventually leads to the Germans abandoning unrestricted submarine warfare for a little bit. You can see here some of the examples of total war, especially a lot of the people working the factories are obviously women because the men are at the front fighting. These are kind of recruitment posters, get as many people as possible to join the militaries because everybody is in the effort for the war.
Propaganda is another example of total war, and the goal with propaganda is you want to control public opinion. You want to keep morale high in your country so people support the war, because if people don't support the war, eventually they'll call for an end to it. So one of the reasons is to recruit soldiers. You want to get people to join the army, and you can see through here – all these posters are kind of trying to recruit men to join the army. Um, a sense of adventure, sense of strong patriotism for your country. Keep morale high at home, make the other side look bad. So these are Germans in Belgium. So these are German soldiers occupying a Belgian town, and this makes the Germans look good. Look, they're feeding the children of Belgium. Never mind that probably the reason those kids don't have food is because the Germans invaded their town. So you, with propaganda, you're trying to make your side look good, the other side look bad, and keep your people wanting to fight. So as World War I began to spiral into two and three years of warfare, morale, though, did begin to break down in a lot of the countries because of how vicious of a war it really was. So Britain is almost bankrupt at this time, along with most of the Europe's, or Europe's nations. They're sending 14- and 15-year-old boys to the front in Austria, France, Germany, because they're just running out of soldiers. There's revolutions all across the Ottoman and Austro-Hungarian empires. But one of the biggest changes, and one that you should definitely make note of is going to be the Russian Revolution right here. So the Russian Revolution changes the balance of power in Europe because the Russians sign a treaty that gets them out of World War I. We're going to go over the Russian Revolution in our next notes, but what happens is the Russians switch from their monarchy to having a socialist Soviet government, and they have to leave the war. So they give a bunch of territory up to the Germans and the Austrians, but now they're able to get out of the war, and Germany and Austria are able to begin to transfer all those troops that they had in the east over to the west, so now they can focus on the British and the French. So right as Russia is leaving the war, another player begins to enter the war, and that's going to be the United States. So the United States enters for a varied amount of reasons, um, one of them being unrestricted submarine warfare. So the Germans resume that unrestricted submarine warfare. They sink a lot of American ships. They sink a lot of British ships with Americans on them, and that begins to make the United States very angry. The biggest reason, though, is what's called the Zimmerman Telegram. So in the Zimmerman Telegram, the Germans ask Mexico to join the Central Powers if the United States enters the war. So if the U.S. enters the war, Mexico will attack the United States. Germany said that what they will do is then they'll send the Mexicans supplies and eventually troops. And when the war was won, Mexico would get back its territories that it had lost to the United States, including New Mexico, Texas, and Arizona. Britain, though, intercepts the telegram, sends it to the United States, and the United States gets extremely angry. I mean, this is a direct threat to the United States. So in April 1917, the U.S. declares war on Germany and enters the war on the side of the Allies. The reasons the United States says that it's going to join the war is, A, to make the world safe for democracy. They're saying that Germany, Austria, Hungary, and the Ottomans, they're a threat to democracy. They're all monarchies. They're all ruled pretty ruthlessly and absolutely by their kings. So the United States wants to defend the democracies of the world. But also, something called Wilson's 14 points. So the 14 points are essentially national self-determination. If you remember back to the vocabulary, it's that idea that if you have a ethnic group, a nation, a culture that wants to rule itself, you should be allowed to do that. And Wilson says the whole reason for the start of World War I was because there were nations that were ruled by people that weren't their own. Think back to Serbia and Austria-Hungary. So he says, if you give people national self-determination and everybody can be independent if they want to, there won't be another war. So this is what the United States would have lost if Mexico had attacked the United States and the Central Powers had won. They would have taken Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. But in reality, this never would have worked. Mexico had just undergone a major revolution. The United States was beginning to be at the zenith of its power, and Mexico never really even considered joining the Central Powers. So these are the 14 points, and you're going to see they're kind of broken up into different groupings, but a lot of them are about that idea of national self-determination. Pretty much from here on down, from five on down, these are all national self-determination. You can see that they're all about 
letting the people who live in that country kind of rule themselves. So you have the peoples of Austria-Hungary. So if Austria-Hungary is broken up, those people are going to have their own governments. Independence for Poland. Returning Aslas and Lorraine, which was part of France, to France because there's French there. So that allows all the nationalities to be with the groups that they want to be with. This one up here, no secret treaties, should be fairly simple. No like blockades like Germany and Britain were doing to each other with freedom in the seas. Free trade, nations should trade and sell things to each other so nobody has those rivalries from colonialism. Get rid of arms so no more arms race. And then down here, this is going to be the new idea. This is the creation of the League of Nations, which we'll go over. The League of Nations was supposed to be like a early UN where all nations would belong to it. And instead of fighting, nations could discuss things. But if one nation in the League was attacked, all the other nations would help defend it. So there would never be another world war. So the war begins to end in 1918, and it really starts with the 1918 Spring Offensive. The German reinforcements from the east arrive, and they attack the Allied lines, and they almost take Paris. But right in the nick of time, the U.S. forces arrive. It's a lot of fresh troops. You can see down here, the United States isn't as tired from the war as the other nations. And at the Second Battle of the Marne, the U.S. forces stop the Germans, and we tip the balance. Um, I know that sounds like very nationalistic, but the United States really is the reason that the balance of power tipped in World War I, just because the United States added weight to the Allies' cause. So the Allies eventually begin pushing towards Germany, and the lines in the Western Front break out, and Germany begins to fall back towards their homeland. Eventually, the Germans see that the war is kind of hopeless. The Austrians see that the war is going to be lost. So at 11 a.m. on November 11th, at the 11th second, um, World War I ends. They all sign an arm armistice to stop fighting. And the German Kaiser actually abdicates his throne, which means the German Kaiser gives up his power. So World War I is over, and now it's kind of time to pick up the pieces across Europe. The toll of World War I is absolutely massive. 8.5 million soldiers were dead, um, upwards of 16 to 20 million are wounded. So there's just a huge amount of people who are lost. Six million civilians died during the war. But one of the major things that happens, and it kind of connects to today, is the 1918 Spanish flu. So the Spanish flu was a pandemic, and nobody's really sure where it started. There's some people that say it started in the United States, some people say it started in Spain, some in China, but it eventually spreads around the world, as you can see from this map, and it ends up killing 20 million. And the reason it's connected to World War I is all the soldiers begin going home. They had all been in close contact with each other in the trenches, so they begin to carry the Spanish flu back to their homelands from them being in World War I. If you pause the video here, you can kind of see the toll um, of World War I on the soldiers who served and on the nations who served and how much it cost. Remember, money back then was worth um, about 10 to 12 times, maybe 14 times as much as it is now. So the cost of World War I is just absolutely astronomical. So one of the first things that happens after the armistice is the Paris Peace Conference. And the goal of the Paris Peace Conference is to just write a peace treaty to make it so there won't be another World War I. Everybody's absolutely horrified by the war, so the goal is to avoid it ever happening again. The issue is the Allies don't invite the Central Powers. Austria-Hungary is not invited. The Ottoman Empire is not invited. And most importantly, Germany is not invited. Russia is also not invited because their government had switched midway through the war, and the Allies do not recognize the Soviet Union that is the new government, essentially, in Russia. There's disagreements over what to do at the Paris Peace Conference and how to avoid another war. America wants peace based on those 14 points that we went over. You know, the self-determination, the uh, freedom of the seas, and trying to make all the nations kind of work together. Britain wants to rebuild its empire. They want to get payments from Germany where they can rebuild their empire in India and kind of keep what they have. France wants a weakened Germany. They want to punish Germany for starting the war. Remember, most of the war was fought on French soil. So France is really, really hurting from World War I. 
Italy and Japan, the other two major powers of the Allies, they want the land that they claimed overseas. And we can kind of see that all of these points are directly against the 14 points. So America is going to be the one that really stands out because Britain wants to keep India, and that's against self-determination. France wants to punish Germany, and that goes against the United States' idea of everybody having free trade and working together. And Italy and Japan want land that they claimed, which again goes against self-determination, the 14 points. Another issue is a lot of the minor nations, they all want self-determination. Serbia wants to rule itself. Uh, Czechoslovakia wants to rule itself. There's nations that don't want to be a part of the empires that they are actually a part of right now. The Paris Peace Conference eventually decides on creating the Treaty of Versailles in 1919. And what is decided there is the first thing is Germany will be punished. So Germany has to take full blame for the war. They are the totally blamed for it. No one else. It is just Germany's fault. Because of that, they have to pay huge reparations to the Allies. We're talking billions and billions and billions of dollars in gold. Germany has to limit the size of its military to about 100,000 men, and they can't have any tanks, they can't have any U-boats, they can't have an air force. They have to give back Aslas and Lorraine to France, and Germany loses a bunch of territory that will eventually help create Poland. And Germany loses all its overseas colonies. As you can see, this treaty is super super hard on Germany. Now, there will be other treaties that are made with the Ottoman Empire where it will totally be broken up, and there will be a treaty made with Austria-Hungary where it will also be broken up. But overall, Germany takes the worst part of the treaties and is forced to accept blame for the war. Another thing that's included in the, League of Na in the Treaty of Versailles is the League of Nations. So this is Wilson's idea from the United States and the goal is every country will kind of join this alliance called the League of Nations, and it'll work on the idea of collective security. So if there's one member in the League that gets attacked, all the members in the League will act as one to put that war out before it grows. So that first, they're going to try and use diplomacy. So if two nations have a dispute, the nations will come together in the League, they'll talk about it, and they'll try and use like diplomatic reasons to resolve that war. If America is attacked by Mexico, then all the other nations in the league will come together and fight with the United States so the war can't grow. The issue is the United States, who came up with the idea for the league, does not join the league. And the United States was only the, the only country left that could really fund the league and send troops to the league because the other nations of Europe are hurting so bad. So the league has no real power. We'll see it'll limp along until World War II until it falls apart. Contained in the Treaty of Versailles is also the mandate system where the Ottoman lands, so the Ottoman Empire that was broken up, and the German colonies will be given to the different allied powers, mostly Britain and France and Japan, to run. The goal was help these nations build up their industry, help them build up their government until they could be independent. But the Europeans turn them into colonies. This angers those mandates because they don't get any self-determination. It kind of says that the only people who get self-determination are Europeans. There's a lot of new nations that are created. So Poland, an area we call the Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia, are made out of territory from Germany and Russia. This is going to anger both of them because they lose territory to create those nations. Czechoslovakia, Austria, and Hungary form out of the collapsing Austro-Hungarian Empire into their new independent nations. The Balkans, so that area where the war started, like Serbia, Montenegro, Croatia, they are all formed into one nation called Yugoslavia. Um, this isn't going to work very well because there's a lot of ethnic groups there that don't really like each other, but now they're suddenly all in the same nation. The Ottoman Empire is fully dissolved, it's taken apart, and it becomes essentially Turkey while losing all of its other territories to the mandates. This leads a lot of nations to be discontent with the treaty, and we're going to see this is going to be fertile ground for World War II. If you look, you're going to see that the nations that are the most angry about the Treaty of Versailles are the nations to start World War II. So Italy doesn't get any of the lands it's promised from Austria-Hungary. They were promised those lands at the start of the war. They don't get any of them. Japan doesn't get its claims on China recognized, which makes Japan more militant over in uh, Asia. China has to accept that Japan got some of the German colonies 
in China, like some of the port cities. And the Chinese say, why are the Japanese ruling over our cities? We should rule over our cities. And Russia is angry because it lost a lot of land to create Poland and those Baltic states of Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. So you can see right there, Germany's angry, Italy's angry, Japan is angry, are three nations that really start World War II along with the, the new Soviet Union that was Russia. So if you take a look at this map real quick, this is... 1914, Europe. And you see our major empires, you see Austria-Hungary, the Ottoman Empire. Remember, a lot of this area is owned by the Austro-Hungarians. And then we compare it to this map here. This is after the war. We can see one of our biggest changes. The Austro-Hungarian Empire has dissolved into these nations that I'm circling in red here. Territories taken, given to Romania and Yugoslavia. Those nations in the Balkans are all formed into one nation. I'm going to circle in purple, which will be Yugoslavia here. In green, Turkey loses all this territory here. The Ottoman Empire is dissolved, and it just becomes Turkey. In this like yellow color, this area down here where I'm going to just circle... This becomes the mandates. So a lot of European nations take over these areas and make them colonies when they took them from the Ottoman Empire. In this light blue color, Russia loses all this land. Russia and Germany combined lose a lot of this land here. So Germany loses its part of Poland. Russia loses its part of Poland. Russia loses here, and they become independent nations. These are going to be major territorial changes that we're going to see in World War II cause Germany and Italy especially to turn to fascism and eventually challenge the Treaty of Versailles. So I hope this kind of helps you understand the end of World War I, and as always, if you need any help, let